Good afternoon and welcome to today's McGill Alumni webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. Over the course of the last decade, exponential advances in technology and artificial intelligence have brought improvements to our lives that would have been unimaginable just a few years ago. Powerful search engines that allow us to retrieve information at the click of a button, sophisticated GPS systems that put the entire planet's maps in the palms of our hands, and advanced medical technology that can diagnose illness and disease far more accurately than the most educated and experienced physicians, or so the developers claim. But as these tools, these tools become ever more powerful, and as we become ever more reliant on their use, are there downsides that might be causing us more harm than good? It's Thursday, August 6th, and in this week's McGill Alumni webcast, are we losing control of the technology in our lives? We sit down with two of McGill's leading thinkers working at the intersection of technology and humanity to explore some of the ethical and societal issues facing those who build our technology and the rest of us who make use of it so frequently. And we'll have a chance to discuss how a new gift to McGill from the Jaroslawski Foundation to establish the Stephen Jaroslawski Chair in Human Nature and Technology promises to further bridge together these two worlds at a critical time in our history. So let's get started by introducing our two panelists. With us today is Ian Gold, who's a McGill professor in the departments of philosophy and psychiatry, as well as a former Canada research chair at Pointe. And he's recognized as one of the world's leading researchers and advocates in the new discipline of neurophilosophy. Welcome, Professor Gold. Thank you. And we have with us Professor Joelle Pinot, who's an associate professor and William Dawson scholar at McGill's School of Computer Science, where she co-directs the Reasoning and Learning Lab. She's also co-managing director of Facebook AI Research and heads up its laboratory here in Montreal where she oversees a team of 25 specialists in artificial intelligence. It's a pleasure to welcome you both. And let me say without any shame that I'm totally comfortable feeling like the least intelligent person in this virtual room today. <laughs> Before we jump into what I'm sure will be an illuminating conversation, a reminder that if you are watching live and have questions for either of our panelists, you can send them in via email to aoc at mcgill.ca and we'll do our best to address them to our guests. We did al already receive some really great questions ahead of time, which we will get to as well. So let's begin by finding out a little bit more about each of our two guests and their work. I'll start with you, Professor Pino. To be honest, I got a bit exhausted just reading your introduction. It sounds like you lead a very busy professional life, both here at McGill as well as at Facebook. Can you tell us a little bit about your work at each organization and how these two worlds intersect with each other? Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm uh, actually, I've been at McGill for several years now pursuing research in artificial intelligence, specifically in the area of machine learning. And so this is the science of building mathematical models and algorithms that enable machines to consume large amounts of data, extract knowledge from that data and use this knowledge to make predictions and presumably predictions that can then be used to solve important problems. And so in this context, um, I've, you know, built many, many different kinds of algorithms that are quite theoretical, but I've also done a lot of work on the more practical side of things, applying these algorithms to making predictions and decisions in the healthcare field, where we've developed personalized treatment strategies for chronic conditions like epilepsy, also working on um, partnership with researchers specializing in cancer, heart disease, and a few other cases. More recently, um, trying to help our colleagues um, with the prediction of patient trajectories for COVID-19 patients. On the uh, Facebook side of things, I, I uh, joined Facebook three years ago to launch a research lab here in Montreal. It's a lab that is one of eight labs worldwide. We have a team of researchers that is really dedicated to the fundamental exploratory research arm. And so the work that we do is actually quite similar to some of the work we're doing in our uh, McGill labs, minus the healthcare applications. Um, and we actually publish papers, open source code, um, and really push the forefront of algorithms for AI. Um, we have a sister organization that looks at taking these new discoveries and applying them specifically towards improving the product and platform of Facebook as a company. Great, well, sounds very interesting, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to delve a little bit deeper into some of the work in both of your angles uh, as we explore this topic over the next hour. Uh, so let me turn to Professor Gold now. Uh, I guess the first question I would have for you after uh, reviewing and reading your bi biography uh, is what exactly is the field of neurophilosophy? And what are some of the questions that you and your colleagues are attempting to answer uh, when it comes, well, in general, but also specifically when it comes to the role of technology in our lives? 
Well, neurophilosophy is a relatively recent subdiscipline in philosophy. It, it was named uh, in, in 1986 by, in fact, a Canadian philosopher, Patricia Churchland. Uh, is the name of a book, a very famous book that uh, influenced me enormously. Uh, neurophilosophy is really a kind of an extension of two areas in philosophy. One is philosophy of mind, which is broadly speaking, uh, the area interested in questions about how the mind relates to the body, how we think, and so on. Um, and the second is epistemology, which is the discipline interested in what knowledge is and how we know things. Philosophers um, have been talking to scientists and interested in science since there's been formal science. Science often renews philosophical discussion, which can get old and tired uh, in isolation. And um, so philosophers have been interested in psychology since the, the founding of the discipline. And uh, when neuroscience began to address questions of cognition, of how we think, and not just questions of how the brain works as an organ, uh, philosoph philosophers began to take notice because of course, cognitive neuroscience is the study of how the brain generates thought. Uh, and neurophilosophy is the field that tries to make contact between philosophy and cognitive neuroscience in order to enrich philosophical thinking with uh, neuroscientific thought. Now, even though the field was named in 1986, philosophers had been interested in neuroscience. One of my, uh, my favorite illustrations of early neurophilosophy is a, is a wonderful paper by the philosopher Tom Nagel, who was interested in studies of brain bisection. So you may know that there is a long tradition, particularly in Montreal, of treating epilepsy by severing the two hemispheres of the brain. And uh, some wonderful and interesting work following those operations done in the lab that first uh, introduced them showed some very subtle and unusual behavior on the part of people who had brain bisections. And Tom Nagel, in a paper in the 1970s, asks, what, what does this tell us about the nature of the self? So that's one early question. Um, but there are a whole range of, of other questions about the nature of vision, about the nature of reasoning. Um, uh, certainly, there's a whole cottage industry of people interested in uh, what we know about consciousness and what neuroscience can tell us about that. Uh, my own work um, is more in the direction of uh, cognitive neuropsychiatry, which is basically the same, the same field except the study of psychiatric disorders. I'm interested in delusions, which are the strange beliefs that are characteristic of some forms of severe mental illness. Um, and uh, those questions, although some of them are scientific, also affect uh, our thinking about philosophical questions like what a belief is, um, what is it to change your belief, what is rationality, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, very brief. I know you had to condense a lot of information into a short intro, but uh, it's giving us, I think, a good sense of where your your sort of expertise and, and, and research focus uh, lies around this discussion of technology, which is what I want to get to next. So let's get to the heart of the question uh, that we posed at the beginning, which is, are we losing control of the technology in our lives? Uh, maybe I'll stick with you, Professor Gold. Um, so now that machines have become so powerful, and most of us walk around with very intelligent smartphones in our pockets you know, all day, is this a good thing? Or are things getting to the point where they're now out of control on the technology front? So what do the philosophers think about all of this? Well, I think whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is something that's gonna take time for us to tell. Uh, I think the, the first thing to notice about this is that technology frightens us. There's, there's something about it um, that uh, generates in many people at any rate a kind of anxiety before they know anything about it. And there are lots and lots of lovely examples about people's responses to early technology. There's, uh, I was just reading a short piece talking about uh, anxiety around steam locomotives, right? People had the idea that human beings shouldn't travel that fast. And there were worries that, that women's uteruses would fly out of their bodies and that uh, the human body might melt if it, if it traveled at such high speeds. And so you see this over and over and over from the very first technologies. In fact, in my own area, surprisingly, um, fear of technology is so pervasive in the thinking of people with delusions, people with psychotic illness, that there's actually a name for a particular delusion. It's called the influencing machine delusion. And the very first written description of schizophrenia from the 18th century actually includes a, uh, an influencing machine fear. It's a fear in, in the initial cases of boxes and cranks and, and uh, chemistry of gases and all sorts of, even the, uh, 
early looms that made fabrics were incorporated into fears about technology. And as technology evolves, the fears evolve. And so recent papers on the influencing delusion talk about fears of lasers and the internet and so on. So there seems to be something deep in our psyche that makes us afraid of technology. Now, sometimes that fear is justified, right? Uh, fear of nuclear technology is justified. Um, often uh, it's not. So I'm old enough to remember when, uh, when uh, video cassettes, VHS cassettes came in and everyone thought, well, that's the end, that's the end of going out. We're all going to be stuck at home and uh, we'll never see other people. We'll never go to the movies again. So that turned out not to be true. Sometimes technology does change things, but in perfectly harmless ways. So uh, you can't very easily buy photographic film anymore. Uh, that's a real change as a result of digital cameras and iPhones, but it's not a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, cars were new technology at one stage and they are dangerous and we've had to adapt to them. So how, I mean, I think it's clear AI is going to turn out to be among those technologies that has powerful effects. Whether those effects are good, bad or indifferent, I think remains to be seen. It's very likely some will be good and some will be bad. And some will be right. indifferent. Right, right, right. Great. Well, so let me turn now to the technologist on today's panel, uh, Dr. Pino. Uh, and you're obviously, you know, surrounded by computer scientists and engineers and software developers every day. Um, so I'm curious to get your take on this question. You know, as much as we love our gadgets and the conveniences that they bring to our lives, um, are we at the point where society needs to maybe take pause and reflect a bit on how much control we are handing off to the machines? I, I, I very much um, think in a same direction as Ian, I think on this point, which is, you know, technology for, for throughout the history um, has, has incredible potential to improve our lives and to, to cause danger and harm. And so AI in the same way has some of these properties and it's really up to us to decide how we will use it. Um, and how we incorporate it in our lives. L let me draw an example um, of, of a specific technology that people may not, may not be aware of. I think if some of our audience today might have heard about this uh, technology called deep fakes, right? Which is a, a very recent ability to use artificial intelligence to essentially transform video in a way that you now see a video that, that is a fake and someone that is you know, shown in the video to perform some action or say something that they didn't do in the real life. Yeah, and and the, the danger with this, of course, is, is really playing with people's sense of reality. You know, when you see a video of someone saying something, it's, it feels very real. And if it's completely manipulated, you really break down the trust in people's um, consumption of information. On the other hand, you take very similar algorithms that are used to create deep fakes. And we've had a few projects recently um, in medicine, for example, using very similar reconstruction technology to construct MRI images. So for those of you who've undergone an MRI, you know that it can take a long time for the machine to acquire a 3D representation, whether it's your shoulder, your knee, um, the same models, the same algorithms can be used to create deep fakes. They can actually use to reconstruct MRI at four or eight times the speed, thereby meaning that, you know, you can use it with a lot more people. You can do it much shorter time, less anxiety. And so there's really, a, 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 really this dual use of this very similar technology that brings us to ask a lot of questions. And, and, and really the, the the questions we have to ask ourselves isn't so much about the technology, it's about how do we use that technology and really frame the questions about, about responsibility. And there's a lot of aspect of responsible use, but frame those questions of responsibility closely grounded to the application. Are they doing good? Are they doing that for a large segment of the population? Are there biases in how it's doing it? Are we being transparent about the full effects of that technology? Um, and so this is, an, this is going to need to be an ongoing discussion. Ian made the nice analogy to the cars, which can both be you know, used as a weapon if driven through a crowd or used as an amazing um, ability to, to move through, through space. Um, over time, you know, we've put in a lot of structure around our use of this. You now have to take driving courses, pass your permits, you know, wear your seat belts, follow the rules of the road. And so all of that structure helps us make sure that we use it in a, in a safe way. And it's a challenge for that structure to follow the development of the technology. Sometimes the timescales are a little bit different. 
And certainly we're seeing this in this case, that the speed at which we've seen innovation on AI over the last uh, decade has been really astonishing. And so for some people really, you know, making sure that the structures catch up has been a challenge. And so I, mean, I think right. that's one of the places where we, we do need a lot of collaboration between the disciplines. Right, right, right. So it sounds to me, and, and I, uh, from listening to both of you, that sort of these, these questions, these issues, we've been wrestling with them for as long as we've had technology. You know, whether it's going back to the first time there was fire. Now we can cook our food, but we can burn ourselves. Yet it seems that the debates are so much louder now and so much more divisive in the last number of years or even the last few months, I would say. Um, why is that, and Professor Gold? Why do you think that the, the, the rhetoric and sort of the divisiveness has, has sort of ratcheted up so much now? It's a great question. Part of it obviously is political. Uh, um, we could go on a long time about what's happening in politics around the world, and I'm going to avoid that. But I do think it's worth pointing out that science is a contentious feature of political debates. Um, it has been for a long time, it certainly is now. And so anything that's associated with new science, new technology, is bound to be incorporated into political debates. But I think that more to the point, what's really interesting and important and different about AI is that unlike uh, locomotives or cars or the telephone or even fire, right, however important it is, AI is in some sense uh, attempting to model us, right? It's artificial intelligence and intelligence for us, the, the, the threshold for intelligence or the analogy for intelligence is what we do. And so when you have someone uh, apparently saying, I don't say that this is what AI people do say, but when the population feels that what people like Joelle are doing is uh, finding a way to replace me or finding a way to do my job better or something, there's this natural fear. Uh, kidding aside, I think the idea of modeling something essential about our nature is always going to be scarier. I think some of the anxiety that we're seeing now, I suspect, I'm a little too young for this, but I suspect was the same sort of anxiety we felt around early molecular biology, right? Where we were told that now we're going to have technology to clone people. Uh, I think I think probably there's something about AI that that strikes a little too too close for comfort mm -hmm. sometimes. Right. So let me maybe go to Professor Pino on that, and maybe within the context of AI. So let me bring in my analogy. Um, you know, I, I remember thinking back a few years ago when we started hearing stories about supercomputers that were built to beat grand masters at chess. And then they did. I thought, well, that's kind of really cool. But in some ways, it's kind of scary that we can we humans can build a machine to do something better than we humans can do, which I guess is really getting at the gist of what AI is all about. So how would you react to that, Professor Pino? I mean, you're doing incredible work, you and your teams in these fields, to essentially recreate the intelligence that is normally the domain of humans. So how do you respond to concerns that maybe it's not a good thing if we have machines that are smarter than us? I, um, I, I think, you know, often, you know, understanding reduces fear and anxiety. And so I have been, you know, in this bathwater of AI for, for 20 <laughs> years now. And so it, it's, it's harder for me to imagine that that level of um, anxiety associated with it, because I know in so many ways how much these machines are so, you know, they, they have competencies that are incredibly limiting. And so for me, the competency to play chess is actually like once you understand what's actually going on is actually much simpler than you know operating a television or a car and yet we've had you know cards for a hundred years now and nobody asks you know what is going on under this hood that might explode before getting in the vehicle in the morning um we've just kind of built that level of trust and so i i i don't want to say that there's no reason to to you know, to ask some 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 really probing questions about the safety of AI technology in different uses, but as a, as a general field, you know, perhaps we've had a little bit of a branding problem, and we should not have made this you know analogy to human intelligence quite so early because I feel that gap between the type of intelligence that is exhibited in our machines versus the type of intelligence that is exhibited in humans is is still miles miles apart. And and some of it, you know, f f the early days of computers, 1950 or so, you know, right from that point, like the, the memory of the computer, it could remember all sorts of things that we can't remember. It can calculate certain numbers on the much higher level of precision that we can. And so 
this is sort of, you know, 60, 70 years in the making that machines can accomplish particular things that, that we can't do at the cognitive level. Before that, going back to the industrial revolution already, machines started doing things at the physical level that we couldn't do. And so these, these transition points we, we've seen before, again, I think, you know, a little bit of history of science is actually always, always helpful in, in understanding kind of the, the point that we're at that we're at today. There are definitely changes in moving from the physical to the cognitive, but still I see that gap between these two two types of intelligence as being still very, very wide. Mm -hmm. So once and, we have your- We don't have good visibility on how to jump that gap. It's not just a question of, you know, right. tweaking a few more algorithms. There's really <laughs> fundamental blockers there. Right. So once I have your attention on this whole notion of AI, and I know we, we've positioned it maybe in a way that seems a bit frightening for some people watching now, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the, the work you're doing at McGill, specifically around AI and healthcare and some of the problems that AI is seeking to solve that will ultimately benefit all of us down the road. Mm -hmm. um, it's been incredibly exciting over the last few years, really seeing the, the, the growth of interests coming, um, I would say, across the discipline of, of medicine for the potential that, and we, we say AI, but more specifically, narrowly, it's machine learning. The ability to consume data and to, as I was mentioning, extract knowledge from that data, and make predictions or decisions. Um, one of one of the cases that we've worked on early on was on the use of um, machine learning to optimize neurostimulation devices. We're talking about really small devices that get implanted in patients with epilepsy and where there's actually an electrode delivering electrical stimulation to the brain in real time. And, and what the AI brings in this case is the ability in real time to see what is the neural activity of the brain at a particular point in time and decide how to change the stimulation strategy in real time in response to neural activity. <coughs> this is the kind of thing that a human can't really do. A human can't spend their whole day just reading the EEG and trying to say, oh, I'm seeing some abnormal activity in the EEG, tune up the stimulation. And so it really opens up new therapeutic approaches for, um, for improving the life of patients with epilepsy. And right. since then, I, you know, I mentioned the work on reconstructing um, MRIs. We've had another project where we use very similar technology to predict the dosage of radiation for patients um, suffering from cancer and try to get much better prediction of how much radiation goes to the organ, that's the target organ, and keep the radiation away from organs at risk that are around that, that area. And so again, really trying to get much more precise models of how to use technology to, to, to both preserve the quality of life of the patient and really target the, the particular pathology. And I imagine that it's also being used on a, on a diagnosis level as well. So uh, doctors yeah. who can maybe identify perhaps a, a mole on someone's skin, whether it's mm -hmm. cancerous, a doctor, mm -hmm. even with a lot of experience, maybe has hundreds or thousands of examples they can refer to, whereas machines can probably siphon through millions of cases, correct? Absolutely, yes. And, and, and more recently with, with COVID patients, we collaborated with some of the Montreal area hospitals trying to see if from the x-ray images, we could actually predict you know, which patients were going to need ICU um, treatment, which were going to need intubation and try to, to really target our, our treatment plans to the patient condition, in particular, including both x-ray imaging as well as some of the clinical and lab features from the patients. Mm -hmm. So how receptive has the medical community been to these advances in AI? Have they been sort of very welcoming and embracing of this? Or I imagine there might be some pushback, like, who are you to build machines to do our jobs better than we've been trained to do? There, there's been, uh, honestly, it's been fascinating to see the shift of receptivity over the last 10 years. The, the, the project I mentioned um, for neurostimulation for epilepsy was one of my first projects in this area. And at that time, it was literally me sort of picking up the phone and calling a few people in the faculty of medicine. And I was very fortunate to, you know, land on a couple of collaborators that were very, very generous with their time, but still very skeptical at the time. Um, and over the years, you know, we had more and more people um, who were receptive to the idea. And what we're seeing now in the last three or four years is really um, clinical researcher who've heard about AI, who've heard about a few applications and really coming to us and saying, I've got this data, I have this prediction question, can you help me? 
and 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 we're at a stage where actually we're we don't have quite enough um, capacity on the on the computer science side to sort of serve up all the all the projects. And so one of the priorities I think for Miguel is to really grow that expertise to enable several of these projects to to take shape over the next year. But but right now the colleagues on the on the on the healthcare and medicine side are, are incredibly um, open, receptive, interested, curious. I mean, exploring what's the potential. Great. So, Professor Gold, I'm curious to get the philosopher's take on medical technology. So what sorts of ethical issues does the introduction of AI bring up in the physician and patient communities? And what aspects should we be most concerned about? Well, there are a, a few issues that uh, have been raised in the literature. <clears throat> One of them uh, has to do with bias. So this is something we've been talking a lot about. Uh, if you're building an algorithm to, say, diagnose uh, melanoma, skin cancer, uh, you put a whole lot of data into an algorithm and you, you build the algorithm to identify malignant versus non-malignant melanoma, say. If you don't put in data about different skin tones, you're going to have a bias. So if your data is not representative uh, of, say, minority communities, then uh, then they're not going to be getting the same level of medical care as, as white people. So that's one sort of problem. The second sort of problem is what's usually called opacity. So uh, if Joel builds um, an algorithm uh, to, again, to say diagnose melanoma, and I'm, and I'm a dermatologist, my algorithm tells me that uh, this melanoma is malignant. I'm a little skeptical. I'm an experienced diagnostician. What do I do? I can't read the algorithm, I'm not a computer scientist. So I'm getting a judgment that I can't interact with. It's not like having a colleague that I can have a conversation with. I can't go in, I can't look under the hood and see why the algorithm is making the judgment it is, or indeed whether it's functioning properly. So that, that's a second problem. That's really a problem about the silos across medicine and computer science. And then I suppose the third one, and, and probably the one that people are most concerned about it, is privacy. So there's lots and lots of medical data that's out there. Um, nobody wants sensitive things to be uh, in the hands of people that we don't know, that we don't trust. And um, that means not just having people know about us, but also potentially uh, more dangerous things. So Joel mentioned an algorithm to deliver um, electrical stimulus to the brain. Uh, if somebody hacks into that algorithm, they can manipulate the electricity coming to my brain. They can they can harm me physically or kill me. So mm -hmm. uh, the the security around um, medical AI is is obviously a serious issue. Wow. Okay. Well, that's uh, sobering, but interesting. I think to bring to the conversation as well. Before we move on to a couple of the other uh, topics that I want to address uh, with the two of you, um, I do want to just stick with you quickly, Professor Gold, and just ask you about this this wonderful new gift to McGill uh, that came in last week from the Jaroslawski Foundation uh, to establish the Stephen Jaroslawski Chair in Human Nature and Technology. So I understand that you're part of the search committee that will be recruiting the first appointee. So what kind of scholar is the committee looking for? And what will this position bring to a university like McGill, given all of these issues and questions we have been discussing here? Well, it's wonderfully exciting, obviously. Um, I think it's very prescient of the Jaroslawski family. Uh, it's clearly the sort of area that we should be focusing on, not just at McGill, but also because Montreal is becoming a high-tech center. Um, so this position actually is going to ask an awful lot of somebody who's appointed to it, somebody who's going to do their own research, looking at philosophical problems around technology, very likely around AI. Um, also building interdisciplinary research groups around philosophy, AI, technology, and so on. But also, I think, acting as a conduit between academia and, and industry, the sort of thing that Joel's already doing. Um, and I, I think of the person who um, is going to occupy this chair as somebody whose fundamental job is really to, apart, apart from doing their own research, of course, is really starting a conversation, the kind of conversation we're having today, starting a conversation about uh, what technology is, what it means for us, how we should be responding to it, and so on. Um, and I think that's really the that's the sort of person that we're going to be looking for. Whether we'll find such a person, I don't know. I'm optimistic. Uh, I suspect we're likely to find such a person among younger folks than around older folks. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. for somebody young. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we'll have to keep us posted on how that search goes. And I'm sure that that scholar will be welcomed uh, into the community when he or she uh, 
yeah. takes the position. So I'd like to maybe shift gears a little bit and talk about another topic that's been in the news a lot these last few months, and, and much to perhaps your surprise, it's not COVID-19, uh, but rather the way in which uh, social media is being used uh, by some to share lies, half-truths, uh, streams of narrow and one-sided perspectives in an attempt to shape public opinion. Um, so, in fact, we just received the question as we've been on air uh, referring to YouTube specifically, which I know has taken quite a bit of heat for its algorithms that suggest new videos to its users that often result in people being fed more and more provocative videos around very narrow, particular points of view. Uh, and, of course, Facebook and, and probably to a lesser extent Twitter have been in the news a lot this summer for being unable or perhaps unwilling to monitor and eliminate hate speech and misinformation from its platforms. Um, so maybe I'll turn to you, Professor Pino. I know you kind of wear two hats, the McGill and the Facebook hat, so I don't want to put you in too awkward a situation, but what do you think these social, social media companies um, should be doing or should they be doing more to exert control over their platforms? Who would ultimately decide you know, what, what to let pass, what to take down? And from a practical and perhaps AI perspective, can these platforms do more even if they wanted to? Mm -hmm a lot there but <laughs> yes um i i think honestly this is one of the challenges of our times and and we can we can talk about it in the in the context of facebook or twitter or you know TikTok. um really the this this challenge of how do we decide what we as a society judge to be appropriate information to communicate whether it's text video and so on um one of the things that's that's difficult in this particular setting is that we are now being confronted with this question, but at the scale of the planet, right? You know, we had a change maybe around the 1950s where television suddenly entered the household and all of a sudden everyone was watching the same broadcast at a national level. But now we've moved that conversation at the international level, platforms, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and so on, reach 3 billion people across the world. And now the challenge is to decide what we as a community judge to be um, relevant information for these people who come out of incredibly diverse set of communities, cultures, um, and historical contexts. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's a deeply, deeply challenging problem. Um, what can, can we do? There's, there's both the fact that the context is so diverse and there's also just the sheer volume of information coming through. I, I don't know the latest numbers, but you know, it's, it's thousands of hours of videos that are uploaded to, to YouTube every minute. Um, and so, whereas in the old days, right, you know, if, if you want to monitor what's going on on TV, you can have someone, you know, you put your 15 second delay and someone watches it and press stop if something really egregious goes off. In this case, given the volume, it's certainly not an option for humans to, to monitor that whole slew of information. And so this is one of the areas where AI has been very, very active. I will say um, a large number of inappropriate content is automatically flagged on the platforms. Um, once it's flagged, either it's unclear whether it's actually bad content or it may be fine content, in which case it's reviewed by a human. And there's a, each company has a set of standards by which they make this decision. And that set of standard is constantly evolving. I, you know, the way we make this decision at Facebook right now isn't the same way it was done even six months ago. Um, and, and so the, there's these standards that people are applying. Once we make a decision on a particular piece, what's interesting is the chances are that piece of information is going to get replicated many, many times. So if we decide that a particular video on YouTube is inappropriate, take it down, there's going to be 10,000 copies of that video. The beautiful thing is now those 10,000 copies AI algorithms are actually really good at taking down right away, even if there's been small changes, filters, size, resolution, the AI algorithms are actually really good. What's hard is that first decision when it's unclear whether is this Mm -hmm. Fine video is this um, actually um, hateful video, or is this, does it show violence? Does it go against some of the community standard? Great. That decision is really hard to make, and I'll just add one of the things that you know that that we have done at Facebook. I don't think it's the end of the conversation, but one of the things we've done is put in place a community standards a group, a board that's made up of external people to the company to advise the company on how to make these very very difficult decisions. Um, just recognizing that this is a, a set of decision that internally we can make to the inside the company. We just have to work with the community to do that. 
Mm -hmm. Great. And, and well, thank you for that answer. And thank you to Catherine White, who sent in the question while I think just before we went on air, that inspired a lot of that. And I think you've answered uh, the questions that she was getting at, which is like, how are these decisions made and, and who makes them and, um, and whatnot. So thank you, uh, Professor Pino, and thank you, Mrs. White, for that question. Um, in fact, maybe I'll turn to some of the questions we got from alumni now. And I have, I guess, the next one for you, Professor Gold, on the same theme. Uh, if you are watching live and do have a question you want to put to us, the email address is aoc.mcgill.ca. Uh, so here's a question for you, Professor Gold. Uh, it came from Anne-Marie Platt. Um, so she's saying, so she wrote that for over two decades, lawmakers and regulators have thrown their hands in the air when it comes to the World Wide Web, saying they cannot control the content. My question has always been, why not? Why is the online publishing world treated so differently than the print publishing world? What has the justification been to allow hate, disinformation, criminal, and antisocial activity to exist in cyberspace publishing when it would never be allowed in print? At the end of the day, is it not human beings creating and distributing the content? Professor Gold? So <clears throat> I think I agree entirely with the presupposition of the question, which is that there ought to be regulation of this content. Um, I think uh, Joelle's already made the point that it's not that easy to do, right? So making editorial decision, decisions for a newspaper is one thing, making editorial decisions when there are hundreds of millions of tweets happen, you know, being, being published uh, every uh, few hours is, is another thing altogether. But I, I think, so setting aside the technical issue of how you do this, uh, I don't think there's any question that it ought to be done. I, I certainly don't think there's any justification uh, for allowing hate speech on Twitter any more than you allow hate speech anywhere else. And in fact, uh, one of our colleagues, Derek Ruth at McGill, one of the things he does is he builds algorithms to detect hate speech. Um, and so I think, uh, I think there is a technical problem, but I think with respect to the principle, there's not much debate, or at least I think there are a lot of people who are uh, in agreement that there shouldn't be much debate. I'll, I'll say one other thing, j just to underscore something Joel mentioned kind of a couple of times, which I agree entirely with is that this is a matter for us as a community to decide. This is not, there, there is no editor as it were. I mean, there's an owner of Facebook and an owner of Twitter and so on, but um, we haven't, and, or at least we shouldn't give up control edit, of the editorial function to some so-called experts. This is up for us to decide. And it's pretty clear, uh, say that Facebook is, is making an effort to uh, incorporate community opinion. And part of what we're doing here uh, is, is exactly that. We're having a conversation about what principles we want to endorse. And then there's a further question about how people like Joelle are gonna, gonna implement them. And that's not easy, but it, uh, it's, it's secondary, I think, to the question of what we as a community want. Mm -hmm. So let me maybe go flip it back to you, Professor Pino. From a technological point of view, I mean, how close is AI to the point where it could effectively monitor, flag, filter out hate speech? Um, I mean, obviously, you can put in keywords, and if somebody sort of praises Hitler, for instance, that's pretty easy, I assume, for an AI machine to detect. But I mean, can AI detect sarcasm? Can it detect hidden meanings and double entendres? I mean, how? Where is the technology vis-a-vis? the ability to control hate speech? Um, with the more obvious content, it's it's quite easy to do right now. I would say we don't do it by a set of rules, whereas in the past, it might have been a set of rules, like here are you know the list of words you can't say, and we're going to pull down anything that says this word. Um, now, if we do it with AI, we tend to do it more with examples. So we will show you, you know, a thousand examples of content that we judge is bad and a thousand of examples of content that we judge is perfectly fine. And the machine will learn how to classify what content is good and what content is bad. But this requires, and back to Ian's point, that requires a human making that judgment of labeling. This is what we call labeling, right? What content is good and what content is bad. And so as long as there's uniform agreement between humans about what content is bad, from an AI point of view, this is not very difficult. In some cases, you need a lot of data. I say a thousand example, you might need a hundred thousand examples to, to do it really well, but it's not that hard from, from a machine learning point of view. What's hard is getting, you know, all of the people around the planet to agree on, on what content is, is fine and what is not. And, and the law has given us some barriers. There is some definition of, of hate speech that are in, in, in operation. And, and, and to, to a great degree, I would say that 
the, the tech companies do follow that, but mm. but it's it, it's it's largely insufficient given the the, the nuance and the, the the volume of material that's coming through. And so that's where I think there's really a gap between the way that the law has phrased it and the just the variety of ways in which it's showing up in the content and the, the decisions that have been made. Mm-hmm. So it's right now for these kinds of things, it's not so much, it, I mean, there, there's some, a few subtleties, but it's, it's less of a, a pure technology problem as really a question of aligning as a society, of what type of, of speech we want. And the reality is, as a society, this has become more and more difficult and, and, and more and more divisive. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of that come up in discussions around political issues, around misinformation related to COVID and so on. Right. And there was a study that came out this week by a McGill PhD student, I believe, talking specifically about how much people are getting misinformation uh, around yeah. COVID-19 and direct correlations between where they're getting their information from, i.e. the more they get information from social media, the more likely it is to be wrong information versus like what you said, Professor Gold, what they get from traditional newspapers, television, that presumably is being checked and filtered by editors who have maybe 30 or 40 reporters to supervise versus millions and millions of unfettered opinions. Um, Let me just stick with you one more question, uh, Professor Pinot. You mentioned politics, and there's obviously a very uh, divisive uh, and important election coming up south of the border in the United States. Are companies like Facebook feeling additional pressure to get things right before Americans go to the polls in November? There is no doubt (laughs) that there is intense pressure to... um, to 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 really raise to the challenge of um, of supporting a, a fair election uh, in the U.S. Um, it's interesting because the the Canadian election we had um, recently at the national level was seen as a little bit of a rehearsal fr- from this point of view that you know it, it's a it's a lot less of a divisive election. It was it's always an important day when you know the whole country is called to the polls but it was judged as less divisive and it was also judged as less likely to be manipulated um, either internally or externally. And, and so there's some things that, you know, Facebook as a company tried. We, we, for example, gave a very high level of visibility to some outside observers around who was, you know, putting out what kind of political advertising and getting some third party, some party, third party to examine some of the decisions that were being made around this. Um, I think in general, with in the Canadian context, actually, the, the response was quite positive from these third observers about um, what the company was putting in place to ensure both transparency. A big issue is transparency in political advertisement. You know that when you see a political advertisement, you'll be able to tell who paid for that advertisement. So that level of visibility was received really positively. Um, and so not just the Canadian election, there's been actually elections around the world, India and other places since then, um, which the company has used as practice ground. But it's clear that U.S. 2020 is a, is going to be a very big one. And in many ways, you know, the stakes are only getting b- bigger every day. The, the attention level was before the COVID situation, which has only served, I think, to really make the situation even more difficult. Right. Right. So, Professor Gold, maybe I'll turn this next question that I have over to you. It's, I guess, the philosopher question here, which is, uh, I mean, we hear so much about, you know, people, you know, outside agitators manipulating information on Facebook and Twitter and other social media uh, platforms. Do these agitators really have the power to shape an election result through a disinformation campaign? I mean, don't we, as seemingly intelligent human beings and voters, have the responsibility to get the information we need to make informed decisions based on our beliefs and values, or am I being completely naive around this? Oh, on the contrary, it's a very uh, sophisticated and tough question. Obviously, we do have responsibility, um, but as the task gets more difficult, it's harder to blame people for not carrying out their responsibility. So um, one of the things I think that social media has changed is uh, the amount of information out there. Uh, if you don't say, uh, have a principle that says, look, I'm going to trust what the Washington Post says and that's it, you know, uh, but you have this idea that you're going to expose yourself to a wide range of information, then, uh, you're faced with a vast amount of information. Now the education part can help you decide what's worthy and not worthy, but when there's such a huge quantity of stuff, making the decision is going to get tougher. Uh, think of it this way. I can drown someone out by shouting very, very loudly, right? 
And I can inhibit free speech, not by preventing them from speaking, but by speaking more loudly. In some sense, that's what's happening on social media. If you can create bots, chatbots, that can generate a huge volume of material, then it becomes very difficult for people to pick out that, those bits of material that are reliable and those bits that aren't. Um, and I'm no expert here, but it looks like uh, that certainly has been uh, an important influence in the American election, 2016, on Brexit, um, and so on. I'll mention one other thing, which is an interesting sort of psychological thing. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that merely telling somebody something or merely reading something registers in a more significant way in our minds than you might think. So in philosophy, we're taught that Descartes told us that if you want to know whether something is true, you assume it's false, and then you go and you get the evidence for it, right? Mm -hmm. And you only accept it when you've got good evidence. As a matter of fact, it looks like that's not how our minds work. Our minds seem to work in the opposite way, which is to say, anytime you hear something, you assume it's true. Psychologically, it registers as true, and you have to make an effort to weed out the falsehoods. And what that means is that mere repetition, even of nonsense, is going to have an effect on our minds that make it more difficult or give us more of a, a, a more difficult task to weed out those falsehoods from truths. And so quantity in this case and repetition, even of nonsense, uh, probably matters. And that's a real challenge. And that's a new challenge. Right. Very interesting. So uh, let's get to a few more questions that have come in from alumni. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but if you do have a question, we'll try to get to it if you send it in to aoc.mcgill.ca. Here's one I guess I'll direct to you, Professor Pino, um, from Henry K. Van Eiken. So interesting. He's asking, can we really expect our senators, elected representatives, and government bureaucrats to be experts in the ethical, social, and political impl implications of technology and artificial intelligence? And what about opposing biases ingrained in conservative and liberal minds? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's a, it, it's a challenge in today's world, given the complexity of the world, to have sort of in one person, you know, the ability to both, you know, contain all the political legal knowledge, as well as all of the scientific and economic knowledge that, you know, we wish our politicians had. Um, so, so I see sort of two, <laughs> two ways that we can at least improve a little bit in the mix. I think, I think we, we, we don't um, traditionally see people from scientific background taking on political office. Um, and I think that's one thing that, that is important for the, the scientists, for people who are trained in quantitative science, engineering, philosophy more broadly, to really take more active participation in the political system and to make it easy to do so. Um, I'm, I'm certainly no specialist of what are the right incentive measures to put in place for this, but I'm a strong believer that, that it, it is always helpful. We've seen some cases of countries with a, really a scientist at the helm and certainly it feels a little bit comforting how they, they, they handle information and decision making based on data and information. Um, and the other thing I, I'm really strongly encouraging, and I think this is one of the things that, you know, is, is a, a great advantage of this chair, is a multidisciplinary education at the highest level. Um, you know, so often we tend to take our, our young, talented students and stream them either through a science stream or to an arts stream. And I think that's not doing them a favor. That's not doing us a favor as a, as a society. I think the first place where Ian and I started working together is in the context yeah. of McGill's cognitive science program, which in many ways is like the flagship program at McGill for students who combine an interest across the disciplines. I think we were both passionate about making that program successful. Um, and I would love to, to see McGill take on more of these interdisciplinary programs involving aspects of arts, technology, and offering that really high quality education to, to, to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that answer. Let me turn this next question to you, uh, Professor Gold. So this one just came in as we've been speaking um, from Ian Anderson in Calgary. So he mentions, uh, rightly, uh, uh, notes that today is the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima, the dropping of the atomic bomb, and that the first uh, Enoch computer was built to do calculations for the atomic bomb explosive lenses. His question is, I guess that's the, to frame it that way. And then his question is, what is the role of government in extending or limiting this technology? For example, Huawei 5G, an intrusive observation 
uh, privacy and espionage. Your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm against espionage. Let me let me just put that out there. Let me be controversial. And atomic bombs. And atomic. Okay, if you, okay. if you press me, I'll I'll take a stand on that too. You know, we like to be controversial. Look, I think I'm going to come back to something Joel said earlier again, which is um, it's easy to think that these problems are problems of technology, but they're not. They're problems of society. Technology is part of the story in the way that all sorts of tools are that all sorts of features of our culture become problems of society. Um, but I, I think to suggest that somehow there's this entity out there, this faceless entity technology, which is causing all the trouble and what we need to do is, as it were, defeat or defend against technology is mistaken. It's, it's us. Um, and so you can perfectly well be against uh, atomic technology, nuclear technology, um, uh, and at the same time be entirely in favor of uh, in favor of the science and the applications uh, that made it possible and and in favor of the consequences and development mm -hmm. of that technology now. And I think that'd be my position. Again, not very controversial. <laughs> I, I, I may add one thing, which is, you know, I, 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 more a strategy level, S certain countries have taken a strong uh, strategy to fund a lot of their technology development through military sort of organizations. We've seen it in, in the US through DARPA and other organization. Canada has taken a different strategy of funding scientific research much more from, uh, you know, both a, a more fundamental science as well as an industry perspective. I, I clearly have a, a preference for the latter approach. Um, and, and one thing we're seeing with AI that I think is quite interesting is a testimony that this approach can be effective. We've seen Canada really rise as a, a, a rise in terms of recognition at the international level as a center, if not the center for AI research around the world. Um, and that has been done using a funding system, which is, you know, the, the, the Tri-Council Agencies, um, NSERC, National Science Engineering Research Council, funding this research um, and funding it, not just for the last five years, funding it for the last 20 years and really allowing that field to grow based on funding to experimental and fundamental science, not funding that was driven purely by economic or military reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's important to recognize really that that, that model can work, um, which for me as a citizen is, is, is really um, quite encouraging. Okay. Here, here. So, yeah, so let's try to get to a couple more questions, uh, maybe one for each of you uh, before we wrap up. So I'll go back to you, Professor Gold, for this one. This one just came in again as we were speaking uh, from H. Wainwright. So he says, Einstein was most concerned and is quoted as saying, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Was Einstein unduly concerned? Well, one doesn't like to disagree with Einstein, right? That's, that's a tough <laughs> question. Uh, I think he was unduly concerned. Um, actually, I also, a lot of the things attributed to Einstein may not have actually been what Einstein said or thought, so I don't know about that. <laughs> but... Um, I think, again, I want to come back to the same to the same point I made a minute ago. It, you get the impression sometimes when you're reading popular stuff about AI that it's this this sort of uh, itself kind of a robot or an artificial system. I mean, it's not. It's made up of people like, you know, very nice, sensible people like Joel um, who are working in a in a in a uh, communal setting that is going to determine what is appropriate and what isn't. Um, uh, AI has a has an off button, right? Um, we don't have to develop the technology that all the technologies that might be possible. We can make decisions about what we think is beneficial, about what we think is helpful, about what we think is interesting and worth exploring. And we can also make decisions uh, like this. You know, this was interesting. It's worth exploring. Now we don't think it's such a great idea. We're going to stop that and do something else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, again to make the same point, I think both of us have been making. Um, this is not a decision just for people in the university or people at Facebook. This is a decision for all of us, because what we want is technology that somehow enhances the public and private lives of people in the community. And so we're the ones who have to decide what it is we're going to ask of AI. Mm -hmm. 
Great. So let's try to sneak in this one last question. I'll, I'll turn it to you, Professor Pino. And I like this one. It comes from Bernard Ornstein. Most of the questions that came to us, and I apologize, we couldn't get to, to even half of them, but came from people who had a bit of a cynical view on, on the technology and, and obviously concerns, maybe the way we promoted the webcast, encouraged that, I'm not sure. Um, but he's sort of taking the different tack. His question is, well, his concern is that by putting restrictions on research because of ethical concerns, um, might we harm our future technological potential? And he wants to know if he's being unnecessarily pessimistic. I think everything is a question of balance, right? That there is that there is a sense by some um, that that we should not, you know, we should not put any boundaries on the research that is being done, and we should give full freedom, and you know that all of the sort of the the the, the responsibility and the legal aspect should be done much much later down the line. Um, I. I, I tend to think that early engagement in asking the question is the most important part. And then, you know, at what point do we come up with the answer of what's the right balance between restraining and amplifying the technology? That that really depends. But that's why, you know, engaging with philosophers such as Ian is, is so important, is that we at least create the space to ask the question very early on. And and maybe it doesn't mean that we're going to, you know, hit the stop button early on. It just means that we're going to shape the way in which we develop the technology. And I will use this as, you know, a point to open up a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is the fact that right now so much of this technology is being developed by, quite frankly, a very narrow segment of our population and, and the, the, the lack of diversity in the people developing the, the the technology is a real issue. We've talked about topical diversity today, you know, bringing in philosophers, psychologists, legal experts, um, but bringing people from different cultural communities, um, different um, groups around the world is in, is incredibly important. And, and and this question of you know how do we shape that technology? Um, to me, a big part of that is making sure that we improve diversity in the people who develop that that technology. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and uh, I know questions are still coming in, but unfortunately, we are uh, getting close to the top of the hour and the end of this this webcast. Uh, so thank you for all of you who wrote uh, world to us, those the questions we got to use today and those that we didn't. There were a couple I should mention specifically for you, Professor Gold, uh, sort of, I guess, asking about the value that philosophers might even bring to this conversation, but I refrain from asking them because I think you've acquitted yourself quite well over the last hour or so. Quite all right. As I said to you, my, my kids ask me that question more or less every week, so I'm used to it. <laughs> um, I guess the last question I would put out there to both of you, and maybe you could each answer in, in 30 seconds. Um, if we were to project ahead, you know, 15, 20 years from now, um, will the, the discussion, the debate have evolved, or do you think that we as society will still be uh, debating these very same questions around technology. Professor Gold? Uh, I think the answer is yes and no. I mean, clearly things are evolving incredibly quickly. Facebook is only 14 or 15 years old. It seems hard to imagine a world without it. On the other hand, some things, even scientific things, do go more slowly than you might think. Molecular biology in the 50s and 60s was convinced that it was months or a year, few years away from revolutionize, revolutionizing everything. It's taken 60 years to start to see the first gene therapies. Um, mm -hmm. So I suspect that some of uh, what's happening now is still gonna be relevant in the future. And certainly issues about ethics and social organization, political organization, these are, these are questions that kind of evolve in geological time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that we'll be talking about them well into the future. Great. And Professor Pino, I see you nodding along. So would you agree that we will be back here in 20 years having the same debate? Yeah, what I would say is the what of the debate might be different. Like it might not be misinformation and deep fakes. The what might be different, but the questions we're asking about responsible use of technology, how to guide that with the values of our society, those questions, as we've discussed today, you know, we've had these discussions for the last at least 100, 200 years, and I expect certainly we will be back here. These are absolutely important questions for us to be asking as a society always. Great, great. Thank you. And I think it's a great, a great note to end this on. So I wish we had more time. What a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, but it does wrap up the time we have for today. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind uh, everyone that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live. 
If you are a Miguel graduate who is not currently receiving our emails and would like to be added to our distribution list, you can visit alumni.mcgill.ca slash register to sign up. And the link will be available beneath the video player on our YouTube channel. And I'll end with some words of gratitude. Uh, first of all, to the Jaroslavsky Foundation for its transformative gift to McGill that will surely help the university and the next generation of students tackle some of the important issues around technology, humanity, and, and, and ethics that we wrestled with today. And of course, a huge thank you to our two panelists, Professors Ian Gold and Joel Pino, for providing such great insight and for tolerating some of my more naive questions. Uh, please join us again in two weeks' time on Thursday, August 20th, when we speak with three senior members of the McGill administration about the challenges the university has had to navigate these last few months as it quickly shut down its physical campuses in the middle of the winter semester and how it's been preparing ever since to welcome back students, professors, and researchers in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll be joined by Fabrice Labo, Deputy Provost for Student Life and Learning, Anya Geitman, Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences and Vice Principal of our McDonald campus, and Laura Weiner, Director of McGill's Teaching and Learning Services. I hope to see everyone back here in two weeks. Until then, please stay safe and be well. Thank you.